All right, let's get rolling. So thanks so much, everyone, for taking the time on a Saturday to join in here and be involved at this um, Empower Your Career conference. The D365 Saturday events have always been a really great thing to be involved in, and we appreciate everybody for kind of giving back to the community and taking time to be involved in these, especially on Saturdays. It means a lot for, for all of these really talented people to kind of come in and give their give their time to the back to the community. So it's a really, really awesome thing. So hopefully everyone's had a chance to kind of attend some of the other sessions and enjoy some of the other presentations. Uh, I think the one you're going to find today is is going to be a lot, a lot, uh, a lot less brain power than some of the other sessions that have been. Out there. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of technical content and a lot of really really deep stuff with the power platform but i want to take it take it back a little bit as a part of this session and really talk to you more about um, some of the things that your your college degree couldn't teach you so with that let me give kind of a quick introduction so my name is dustin damaris um, i'm a senior solution architect and managing partner for dynamic consultants group I've had about 18 years in the technology consulting industry, specifically around banking, manufacturing, sports entertainment, and then a lot recently in construction and some of the software industries. About 15 years in software as a service, platform as a service, specifically around ERP solutions, Salesforce, SAP Business One, Microsoft Dynamics, of course, uh, Power Platform, a lot of those things more recently. And then a fun little fact about me, not really technical related at all, but I'm also a certified marriage and family counselor. So that is uh, something that's not nerdy at all, but it's just something that I enjoy doing to help people um, in some of my spare time. The company that I work for is called Dynamic Consultants Group. So I'll give kind of the quick shameless plug here. We're a partner to partner consulting company that is involved in kind of placing um, individuals at partner locations, whether that be North America, Europe, Africa, uh, wherever the case is, pretty much all development services related around Microsoft Dynamics, um, full Microsoft Stack, Azure, Office 365, all of those platforms. So let's just kind of um, talk a little bit in general about what we hope to kind of get out of this session. And, and I hope that you'll find some of this content is, is a little bit basic, but also helpful in the things that you're been dealing with and especially some of the things that you've noticed. So this, this presentation I seen whenever we started the um, call for speakers for this Empower Your Career conference, I really felt like submitting this session especially because this is something that we do for a lot of our junior consultants. So as we bring on new consultants, um, we've hired a lot of people in our company. It's very specific to Dynamics. We've also hired some people that had no background whatsoever in business or technology period. So whether that's someone coming in from an internship or whether it's hiring someone come from a completely different career. We have one of our very senior consultants today that got his start as a foreman in a concrete company. So kind of taking a step back and seeing who are the people and what are their skills that makes them so good at consulting is a really important thing for us to look at. And so we do this um, session for a lot of our new hires, and I thought maybe it would be a really good thing to kind of show here as a part of this Empower Your Career Conference. So not going to be very nerdy, but we're just going to get back to the basics on some things. So I'm sure a lot of you have met some great consultants in your time, but the question that I would ask everyone is what really made them great? Was there just some incredible way that they had about uh, asking questions that was so good? Was there... Uh, something inside of their just the, their way that they presented themselves to a customer with confidence and giving them really sound advice. Like what was the thing that made that consultant great? Well, consulting has been around for centuries. I mean, as humans, we're pretty much wired to ask for ideas and validation from other people and our fellow humans. But this certainly doesn't mean that we're all good at giving advice and validation. And, that, and that's really what consulting is. So, so why do consultants, some consultants intrinsically instill confidence in those that they talk to and others just don't? 
whether you're customer facing, world-class introvert, it doesn't matter. You can build these skills. You can learn how to do some of this. And I think by learning some of these very basic things, it's going to unlock that mystery of what really is this great consultant, what makes him great or him or her great, uh, what makes them great. And I think by looking at some of these things, you'll be able to see some of those characteristics, um, some of the attention to detail and some of the small things that makes uh, make some sense as to, to what you've noticed. So let's just talk in general about our, our projects as a whole. So the things that we're doing every day, right? We're constantly getting requirements from customers, developing software solutions or implementing power apps or things um, on different stacks that will help our customers have better systems. And it's supposed to help them fix their business. But a lot of times this light switch illustration here. This is kind of the way that our customers view these projects that we're working on. So they, they see it as just a real utility mindset to some of these things. The software is supposed to fix our business. It's supposed to make us more efficient. It's going to eliminate all that double entry that we have across multiple systems, but that's just not the case. And sometimes they get upset when it doesn't, or they get disgruntled about the way that the system's been, the project's been going. But the truth is, is what we do is extremely complicated. There's not just one um, solution that fits every single customer's problem the same way. These systems are complicated. And on top of the system, most of the time, the customers themselves have years of processes that have to be unraveled and rebuilt. And then not only the processes and systems, but you put people involved and they have their own agendas about the way that they want to do things and internal company politics and bias. And then just the emotional part of the system. Like if I do this, am I going to have a job anymore? And how is this going to impact what I do every day? All of those kind of things that we grapple with, with the customers that we work with, that's all a part of it. And so it's not just about the software. And in fact, very little of what we do is really about software. It's more about the people and it's more about the way that they do things and helping them understand and coaching them in a way and helping be a teacher to them that is more important than any of the software that we would ever build. So really I wanna kind of highlight five points today. How do we combat that complexity? How do we combat the light switch mentality along with the real complex nature that we know that these projects take. So first and foremost, we're gonna talk about building relationships. How do we do that with our customer? Second, gathering and understanding the requirements. We have to do that to really be able to build a solution. So how do we better understand those requirements and how do we document it? And then also just some communication foundations. So the third item is gonna be more around communication via phone, email, uh, what's the proper procedure? How should you do it? How should you be thinking about it? The fourth thing we're going to talk about is difficult conversations. So <laughs> projects never go well 100% of the time. There's always some difficult conversations that you have to have in every client relationship. So how do you deal with those? And then fifth, we'll kind of talk about, kind of close it out by talking about just some of the technology that you could potentially use and how you should be leveraging some technology to fit with these other four items. So first, let's talk about building relationships. So the first item that I've called out here is don't just do the work. Take the time to really build a relationship with your customer. So this is the one of the key differences between a good consultant and a great consultant. A good consultant will take the requirements and they'll do the work and the customer will be happy. But a great consultant will not only do the work and make the customer happy, but they'll also make that customer fall in love with them. So they will really build a deep relationship. Uh, I've seen consultants that had such deep relationships with their customers that literally the customer thought they worked for their team. I mean, it becomes such a close relationship that they truly trusted everything that that person said and did. And that is really what makes the difference between the good and the great consultants. So there was a study done um, back in 1998, uh, and then it's been, had a lot more kind of publicity recently because of some books that have been written and some of the new advancements that have been had. But Simons and Levin had an experiment where they actually did some uh, research around what they called change blindness. And some of you may have heard some of this before, but this change blind study, essentially what they did is they set up a fake 
convenience store and someone would walk in, they'd pick out the things that they wanted to buy and they would walk up to the counter and they'd begin to, to pay for those items. Well, while they were paying for the item, the person who was behind the register or behind the counter would uh, just say, just one second. And they would duck down under the counter and a completely different person would pop up on the other side. So completely different person now that you're interacting with. And 50% of the participants never noticed that the person behind the counter actually changed. That is just an incredible statistic. And so this is something that they, they call change blindness, right? Where you're not really making a connection with the people that you're interacting with because you just don't have the mental capacity to do it all the time. You can't do that with every single person you come in contact with unless you try. You have to try really hard to do that. And that's something that we have to focus on. So many times we're in these meetings and I'm guilty of it. I've been in a discovery meeting with customers where we're all sitting around a table and we're having a requirements discussion and we're talking about sales and marketing. And I don't even really remember the people's names that are around the table. And I realized that I wasn't paying close enough attention to the relationship part of what we were doing there. I was so focused on the business requirements and some of the other things that we were trying to accomplish that I ignored the people. Uh, and that's one thing that we have to take advantage of as a great consultant is to really take time to build the relationship, not just gather the requirements. <clears throat> the second item, we have to be a teacher. So there's an old saying that says, if you, only, if you only know three chords on the guitar, teach someone who only knows two, right? We have to have the heart of a teacher and that's gonna come through in everything that we do. And, and the other thing is, is don't be afraid to train yourself right out of a job. So many times I think we're afraid as consultants to give too much training because we're afraid they won't need us anymore. But nothing could be further from the truth. I found that the more we teach our customers, the more we empower them to do things for themselves, the more that we really become a teacher for them, the more the business will follow. We don't have to be worried about training ourselves out of a job. The third item is don't just say yes. So customers are really going to appreciate you for being an advisor, not just a doer. You remember we talked about before having some great people that can do things, but who are the great advisors? Um, those are the ones that don't just always say yes. We have some amazing doers in this industry, people that can build power apps, power BI dashboards. I mean, they can just do some incredible stuff with some of the Microsoft technology. But sometimes we walk into customers and we're like, man, I just wish somebody would have told them no to this. It's not about what we can do, but sometimes it's about telling them, no, we can't do that and we shouldn't do that. And here's the reasons why. That's what truly makes a better consultant um, from just the ones that go around and just do everything. Instead, be willing to engage with the customer. And sometimes the answer is no. Um, and that is not the best way to do things. So fourth, you're not always the hero. So, so really think about this because being nice is important, but you're not always there to be the good guy. Sometimes consultants are brought in to be the bad guy at the company. And they, the companies really need to make serious changes in their business process. And you have to understand that. And you've got to understand that your role sometimes as a consultant is not just based on the project work you're doing, but it's also based on the company you're working with. So it's based on the people and what they need to do to accomplish their goals. Sometimes software doesn't have anything to do with it. So don't always try to be the hero and give them a new piece of software. Sometimes it's your role to be the bad guy and say, you're not on the right track here as an organization. And here are the changes I'd recommend you making. Uh, that's a hard conversation sometimes, but it truly is the thing that makes the great consultants um, different from the good ones. So I thought this slide was um, a little comical, but, you know, sometimes we are just therapists. A lot of our job role is just initiating conversation and then sitting back and listening to the answer. Um, if you get into a confrontation, sometimes it's not the right thing to do to step in and help sales and marketing and customer service really get together and solve their problems. But sometimes as a consultant, you get them around the table and you ask a question and then you just step back and let them figure out the answer. 
And, and I know you've seen this happen many times during these discovery sessions and requirements gathering and um, testing sessions that you've done and user acceptance, all of those things. It happens. It happens all the time where we're engaging in those conversations. And then we realize that, well, we're not even really in part of this conversation anymore. It's just the, the departments that are talking. And that's okay. Don't feel like that you have to jump in and get involved in those things. Uh, sometimes it really is just about asking good questions and then stepping out of that internal conversation that needs to happen. So let's talk about how do you actually run some of those therapy sessions? <laughs> we, we need to know how to ask good questions, right? That both solve our purposes as a, as a consultant to get what we need in order to build the system. But then we also need to know how to facilitate the solving of their issues and sometimes the um, furthering of their purposes. Because sales will have their own agenda, that they things they want to see accomplished with the project. Marketing may have a completely different set of requirements that they want to see. So we've got this balancing act to play on how we get information and really come up with a solution that's going to not only solve the real system problems, but also help the people problems that are involved there as well. So this is a slide that I encourage all of our consultants to take and make sure that they have a copy of in every single requirements gathering session that they run. So these are just a set of questions that will really help facilitate some of those conversations. And, and asking good questions is a skill. Sometimes you've got to practice at it. But so many times I've been involved in these meetings and it seems like we're so focused asking the questions about the system and getting all the technical details. And we got to have that. Uh, we've got to have what we need to build the system, but we forget to ask the questions that are going to allow the users that relationship part of it, the ability to open up and give us the real answers of what's truly the problem. Questions like, what do you think the main challenge is? What's working well in your organization? Why is that important to you? What do you think the impact to your customer would be if we did that? What can we give the team that would make their life easier? What's the main obstacle of everyone from using this tool? We see that a lot with like rescue projects where we may ask the question, why isn't everybody using it? Let's talk about what, is the ob what are the obstacles for why no one's using the tool? And then how do you think this is gonna be received by the team? If we do this, how do you think the various teams are going to receive it? Those kind of questions will really not only get the system requirements out, but it'll also help them to open up and really tell you what's going on in their organization. Um, and rescue projects are the, <laughs> a great way to start this. So if you've got a client that the project is not going well and you've been brought in to kind of help some of this, these questions will be a goldmine for you to be able to get the answers out for what you want. But sometimes the answer is really hard. And a lot of times it's because there really is more than one right answer. When we're listening to a customer tell us what they need, they could be describing it accurately. And when we document it, we could be documenting it accurately. But then when we deliver it, it wasn't at all what they were expecting. So why is that? How is that even possible? And so we always default to, well, the customer must not have told me the 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 right requirements or, um, well, when they approved it, they just weren't thinking about it the right way. But some of that's not true. Sometimes it really is that complicated that there really are more than one right answer. And what they're thinking about is not necessarily the same thing you're writing down. It's not necessarily the same thing that you're building. And so you just have to keep in mind, sometimes you're just not as good as you think you are. <laughs> Your memory is not as good as you think you are. Your, your documentation skills are not as good as you think they are. All of those things are really important for you to acknowledge that I have weaknesses and sometimes I'm not always right. Sometimes I really did miss those requirements. And making sure that you are able to admit those things to your customers and say, yeah, maybe I did miss that requirement. Let me go back and review my notes again. And I apologize if I did miss that requirement. Those kind of things are going to open you up to be able to build a close relationship with your customer. And this truly is the difference between some good consultants and the truly great ones. The truly great ones are willing to admit that they have some things that they're not good at and maybe that their memory wasn't as good. Um, but to be able to actually 
put things into the system that they need, you have to be able to willing to be willing to admit sometimes that you didn't always hear that correctly. So another kind of uh, saying that I've heard out there is you should welcome new ideas, but don't let them move in. So there are always some foundational items. And I think some of these things are some of the stuff that we're going over today and really talking through what are some of the foundational things that you've done. But as you progress through your career, you're going to find some very key things that work great for you. Some things that really help you establish customer relationships, that help you to do good documentation, ways that you know of that really lead to a good result, whether that's physically writing something down, taking the notes in OneNote, delivering some sort of a user requirements document, you're going to find what works for you. And then there are going to be these trends and these fads that come up about consulting and you're going to go to a seminar and you're going to hear some really cool things that are out there and some new ways to do stuff. And those are all good. We should always welcome the new ideas, but we shouldn't always let them take a place of the things that we know work. And there's a fine line here between being entrenched in what you've always done and welcoming new things, but a great consultant will always weigh both of those and they will try to have just as much of things that they know that works in the project as the things that they're going to give it a try because it's something new or something that they heard of that other people are doing. So the great consultants will always have that kind of war in their mind. And you'll sometimes see this working in a requirements gathering or an architecture session where they will be asking questions and you'll see them kind of steering one direction, maybe towards a technology that's, that's a little outdated, uh, but then they will kind of teeter back. Those are the kind of things that are happening in their mind is that they are really trying to weigh the things that I've always done and the foundational things that I know work versus the new stuff that I know is out there and I'm not totally sure if it's gonna solve this problem or not. Both of those are great things to look at. You have to look at both of them, but you also have to make sure that you're doing it in balance and not always looking for all the new stuff, right? Microsoft releases something new every week, but that doesn't mean we have to really be embracing to its fullest every single thing they release every week. We have to make sure we have a mix of the things we know that works for a company and the things that are new and the trends and some of the latest, uh, latest and greatest technology and, and solutions that are out there. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think there is a balancing act there that we all have to play. But the great consultants do an amazing job at doing that balance for their customers. All right. So the third bullet point is the foundation of communication. So what are some of the things that we should always do when we're communicating with our customer? So we've talked about building a great relationship. We've talked about then taking that relationship and being able to um, gather requirements and make sure that you're getting to the root of the real issue and or requirement that a customer may have. But then once you've got those requirements, how do you communicate? How do you make sure that you're having good meetings? How do you make sure that you're documenting things well? How do you really ensure that those kind of things are, are followed through on? So let's talk about it. The, one of the first items, and some of you may have heard of this term, but there's the aid it term. And aid it is really just all about whenever you have a meeting or you've called a meeting, um, you're starting off a meeting, you should always kind of follow these five bullet points. And that is announce yourself, make sure that you've got kind of a quick opening statement there that is, hi, my name's Dustin. Um, you introduce yourself, which is talking a little bit about your experience. Don't get too crazy with going into every certification you have and all the customers you've worked with. Um, you'll, you'll run off some of your customers by doing that, but make sure you at least announce yourself, give a quick introduction of who you are, talk about the duration of the meeting, make sure that you're saying, look, we're going to be here for the next hour or so. If we get done sooner than that, we will make sure and um, cut it short. We want to give everybody their time back. But as a part of this, we want to talk about our expectations, the fourth item. Our expectations of this meeting is we want to make sure and get these four things accomplished as a part of our meeting. 
And then at the end of that meeting, make sure you thank everyone for taking their hard time that they work for and making sure that they're giving that to you and thank them for taking the time to meet with you. Those kind of five things are just really foundational items. I'm sure everyone's kind of heard of these before, but every single meeting you have, if you announce yourself, introduce yourself, talk about the duration, talk about your expectations and tell them thank you, you will have a better open communication with your customer than if you miss those things. So follow those best practices. So as a part of this, you also have kind of some in-person meetings and this works for phone call and, and conference meetings as well. But man, just always say please and thank you. Like I, I feel like these are, um, I feel like I'm maybe getting a little too kindergarten or, or too junior here for you guys, but just please and thank you can sometimes go a long way to building that really close relationship with your customers. And I feel like sometimes we just forget. We get so used to working with people and we get kind of casual about the way we interact that we just forget our general courtesy. So make sure you don't do that. Make sure you're taking the time to really have respect for people and telling them please and thank you. Also, um, make sure you introduce other people. If you're on a call or a conference call or an in-person meeting, it really doesn't matter. Make sure that when someone else is there with you that you're taking the time to introduce them. Uh, I've been in meetings before where I walked out of the meeting and I still didn't know the names of two or three other individuals that were there because the other person who brought them in didn't take the time to introduce them. So just make sure that you're taking the, that time up front to introduce the rest of the, the, the team members that are going to be there with you in the meeting. And uh, this, uh, this third bullet point is something we cover, but you know, obviously social distancing, we're not going to do as much of that right now. But when the time comes, handshakes. Make sure that you take time to really to do those kind of things. It really does kind of build that personal connection with your customers. And the fourth item on this list, don't interrupt. You know, I've met a lot of really good consultants and I've been guilty of this as well, where you're in a meeting and you feel like you have the right answer and you feel like you already know where they're going with it. So you jump in and just kind of go ahead and push the meeting forward. Feel, don't feel like you can interrupt people. Take the time and let them talk. Remember back to our therapy session, right? A lot of what we're doing here is just therapy for our customers. So make sure you don't interrupt them when they have something to say. So keep it that way. And also some of these things may be a little too junior for everyone on the call, but keep it clean, right? Make sure your conversation, that you're not, that you're not talking about things you shouldn't. And sometimes it can get a little too casual, um, make sure that you keep things professional. And I think you're going to find that the great consultants, there's very few times when they're not keeping everything professional. And kind of along with that, avoid the big two. So religion and politics, right? Everyone kind of knows those that uh, you should try to stay away from religion and politics as a part of your topics. It really will kind of make the difference sometimes between a good meeting, a good conversation, a good relationship, and one that is not going so well. So let's talk about proper cell phone use. Um, I know that kind of text messaging, especially lately, has kind of become more and more a part of what we do, uh, especially even customers texting you and, and all of those things. What I try to do is I really try to follow the same etiquette that I would with an email when I'm using text messages to a customer, not necessarily to my friends or family, that, that sort of thing. But as a part of just kind of how I interact with my customers via text message, I try to treat it just like it's an email. Make sure you have an opening, a body, a closing, some of those things. We'll talk more about that later. But just also from cell phone use, think about this in meetings also. It is extremely disrespectful to be looking down at your phone, to be uh, constantly looking at something that, that's going on somewhere else while a customer's talking to you. And sometimes I've seen consultants that, you know, they're in the meeting, but they're not really there. That is one to be one of the biggest differences between a good consultant and a great consultant is a great consultant will go to that last bullet, will always show genuine interest in what the person has to say. So every person, even if they're not really that interested in what the, what the customer is talking about, 
they will absolutely show genuine interest in every word that comes out of your customer's mouth. Um, and that will truly make you a great consultant. If you just take the time to make the personal connection with people, don't uh, let things interrupt you and make sure that you're really showing interest in everything that they have to say. And I feel like some of that stuff's probably a little too basic, but sometimes it's good just to get a little reminder um, of, of some of those things. And I think you'll notice that you, you've sometimes gotten a little too casual with some of those items and you can do better. So let's talk about email. Um, this is kind of one that, that I think that you know, I, everyone's probably heard this at one point, but I don't know that we always follow it. So let's talk a little bit about email. So in every single email, and I coach our employees and our consultants that every single email, whether you're replying to a customer's email or whether you are starting a new email, it doesn't matter. Make sure it has a subject, make sure it has an intro, a body, and a closing. Those four components should be in every single email that you send. Don't get too casual um, sending an email with just okay or thank you or something like that. Make sure you're taking the time. And it doesn't have to be long. Um, your subject can go in this email subject, of course, making sure that that's always there. But it could just be, hi, Chris, thank you so much, talk to you later. You know, those kind of things will make sure that your email follows a general pattern of intro, body, and closing. Making sure you have all of that in every single email that you send will really show your level of professionalism. And running spell check. I, I feel like we shouldn't have to say that, but this is something that we do coach every one of our consultants on. And we still see that from time to time, Someone sends out a requirements document, they send an email, um, they do a OneNote document, and they just haven't run spell check on it. They haven't taken the time to really make sure that all of their words are spelled correctly. And it's not always just about professionalism, although that's a huge part of it. It's also just about being able to understand what's written. Um, sometimes whenever I read things and things are spelled funky, I don't exactly know what they meant when they wrote it. So making sure you take the time to run spell check on that. And, and especially if, if English is a second language or if you're writing in a language that's not your first language, the Grammarly tool, if you've used that, really is a fantastic way of doing it. So the third bullet there um, is Grammarly. And that really will help you make sure you have good sentence structure, make sure you're using proper punctuation. It does a lot of those tests for you and so comes back with a result. Uh, I, I actually have that tool installed on my cell phone. I have it installed inside of Office, and I also have it installed um, inside of my email engine as well, inside of Outlook, uh, online and on the desktop app. So you can use that. It's a really great way of just kind of quickly checking your um, documents and everything that you do, not just for spelling, but for full grammar check. And this may seem time consuming. It may seem overkill to everyone but it really will make the difference in a level of professionalism that you show to your customers um, versus if you don't take the time to do it. So phone calls and conference calls. So we're talking now about communication, right? Email and meetings, and now we're on to some phone calls and conference call specific things. So best practices, um, you don't have to do everything I say, obviously, but this is just something that I try to coach all of our consultants on, and that is when you're doing a phone call, make sure you always answer appropriately. So if you're using a company provided cell phone or your personal cell phone, whatever it is that you're expecting to receive company calls on, uh, Microsoft Teams, whatever tool you're using, make sure that whenever you answer, you're answering appropriately, that you're not answering, uh, that you're answering professionally, you're introducing yourself. Hello, this is Dustin. Um, whatever the type of response you normally give, make sure that it's professional. And also, sometimes you're going to get people's voicemails when you give them a call. Make sure you always leave a message. And I know in this day and age, it's very common. Most people don't leave messages before. They'll just follow up with a quick text or they'll send them an email, those kind of things. Make sure that you're leaving a voicemail. It is actually 
um, disrespectful even to call someone, to take their time, to make a phone call, and then not leave them a message asking them to call you back or letting them know the subject of your phone call. And if you're one of those folks that are call screeners where you're constantly just ignoring phone calls because you want someone to text you or email you instead, having that voicemail will let you know whether or not it's an important enough to give them a call back or whether it's something that could have been an email. Um, so make sure that you're leaving a message. It's just common courtesy for those that you work with. And avoid the merry-go-round of phone calls. So sometimes I call you, you call me back. I then have to call you back, kind of that phone tag situation where we're constantly calling each other. Avoid the phone merry-go-round. I always kind of coach our consultants, if it happens twice, if I've called you and you've called me and we both can't get a hold of each other, immediately move to another form of communication whether that's a text message or an email or a Teams message, whatever it is. If you've gone to the point where you need a phone call and you've done it twice, don't just keep going back and forth on phone calls. Pick a different channel of communication because it's just unprofessional to continue going back and forth with phone calls. Also, stop the email and make the call. I have seen so many emails that have gone back and forth for days at a time where you're trying to get to the root of a problem, whether you're trying to solve something. And this is especially true in a debugging situation where I'm asking you to try it and you're fixing something and then asking me to try it. And then I ask you to try it again. And we go back and forth and that can take days sometimes when we could have just got on a phone call and spent 30, 45 minutes, an hour together and solved the issue altogether. So again, I try to coach our consultants that after two or three emails of you going back and forth saying the same thing to each other, stop, pick up the phone and make a phone call to them. Um, it's just different. It's a different level of customer service than it is if you truly want to build that deep relationship with your customers. Conference calls. So I've only listed three here. Uh, there's been some really good blogs that I've read recently with everybody starting to do uh, a lot more remote, remote work. And some of, some of you guys have worked remotely from home for years, but I know that and you're really good at some of these things. And a lot of the rest of us are just getting used to a lot of the conference call where we're on them all day long every day um, since we're working remotely. But I've only listed three. There's a lot of blog articles out there that I've seen recently that give a lot more in-depth, really good things to do for conference calls. But just kind of the top three, make sure you're fast to mute and unmute. Make sure that you're not waiting a long period of time to unmute yourself when you're asked to speak or when someone asks you a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also make sure you're good with the mute button. So once you've answered the question, you can mute yourself again. So that way any background noise or things that are there, whether you're working from a coffee shop or anything else that you would make sure that uh, that background noise is as limited as possible. And I think you'll find that a lot of the great consultants that you know are very good at working that mute and unmute button, whereas a lot of your good consultants are not so good <laughs> at working the mute and unmute button. And it's a skill. You have to learn it and you have to be really good at knowing how to do that. Um, so I'll also kind of coach you on this. This is something that um, I also go over with our sales team and some of the other folks on, on, our, um, on our meetings is that if you're going to pull someone else into a conversation, so let's say you have five to 10 people on a call, I'm talking, uh, I'm engaging with another person, and we're going back and forth kind of having a conversation, everyone else is on mute. If I'm going to reach over here and engage a completely different person and kind of pull them into the conversation, and instead of just saying, hey, John, what do you think about that? Instead of doing that and leaving this giant pause, instead, give them kind of a warm handoff. So, John, let me ask you about this. And I know that we were just talking a little bit more about how we could take this Power BI report and make it a little bit more usable for the users. John, can you give us your feedback and let us know what you think about that? You see how I kind of gave a long section there for John to get off of mute. Make sure that you're doing that with your colleagues, especially when you're on the call with customers. Don't leave them hanging. Give them kind of that long, warm handoff to give them the ability to get off of mute and be prepared to respond just so that way everything flows and everyone stays professional. Also, say and ask who's talking. 
um, especially with big conference calls where you have a lot of individuals on the calls, it's really hard sometimes to know who's talking. And obviously, if you're using a tool like Zoom or Teams or any of the others, you can kind of see the little box that shows you who's talking. But if there's five or six people that are unmuted, it, it's really difficult to know exactly who was talking during the call. So what I like to do is as we're kind of talking, if someone brings me in, I'll say, hi, this is Dustin. And then I will just immediately then go into my, my statement just to introduce myself every time that um, I try to say something. Uh, and then the same thing is true if you don't know who's talking. Take the time and ask. Remember our conversation earlier about kind of building personal relationships and truly caring about what that person has to say. If you do, then you're going to want to know who's speaking. So if you're on the call and you don't know who it is that's speaking, kind of stop and, and say, I'm sorry, who is that? Uh, I, I think I recognize your voice, but wh who's speaking right now? And I think that will get everyone else also in the habit of announcing themselves so that way everyone knows um, as part of a conference call who it is that's speaking. And the other piece of it is use video when reasonable. So it is amazing to me um, how much of a more of a personal connection that you can have whenever you have meetings using video. Uh, it's more like a face-to-face -face conversation and it's, it certainly doesn't always take the place of, of an in-person meeting. Uh, we still very much kind of believe that that is a way to build those deep relationships, especially with your customers at key points in the project where you're going to be spending time on site with them or visiting with them, especially now. And then also um, as you kind of do this more and more and people are working more remote and you're starting to engage more across the, across the globe uh, with remote workforces, make sure that you're using video as much as you possibly can when it's reasonable. So let's talk about <clears throat> difficult conversations. Every project and every customer relationship that you have, even if they don't end up getting heated and the customer's upset, you will always have a point in time where you're having a difficult conversation with your customer. And so understanding kind of how you approach those conversations and what you should do really will help you to navigate the waters of those difficult conversations and make the outcome the best for both parties. So the first step is recognize when you're in a difficult conversation. And, and sometimes that's not easy. The customer could start off being very friendly and then become combative about a specific topic that you're engaged in. So make sure that you understand when that tone shift happens in the conversation that now we're entering into a difficult conversation whether it's about project budget or scope um, or why that certain system does or doesn't do something, um, why that you felt like the requirements weren't gathered correctly, all of those kind of things end up and can become difficult conversations. So recognizing when that tone shifts and when it becomes a difficult conversation is key to then now kind of following the flow for, okay, now I know I'm in one, what do I do? So what do you do once you're in a difficult conversation? <clears throat> the first thing that I like to do with a customer is just remind them that we're on the same side. So kind of remind them that, hey, you know, we're, we're both in this together. We really want to see your project succeed just as much as you do. Uh, that kind of reassurance will help to steer that difficult conversation in the right way. And making sure that they know that we're wanting to create value together. Hey, we want to build this Power BI dashboard and get it working for you just as much as you do. We want to make sure that this Power App that we're developing for you works for your business just as much as you do, because we want you to be a success story for us. We want you to be one of our key customers. Uh, those kind of things kind of reassure the customer that you're both wanting to create that same set of value. And then the other thing that I try to do is make sure that you're encouraging them that and that we're going to work together to find the answer to this. Whatever the difficult conversation that we're in right now, we're going to work together to figure it out. This is not just going to be me telling you how it is, right? And sometimes that's appropriate, but for the most part, I want to see things from your perspective. I want to know what you think about this. I want, and we're going to work together to find out the right answer for this problem that we're facing. And then sometimes you have to get really curious to solve the problem. 
So you've got to really understand what truly is driving the problem that they're facing to then get creative and solve it. So once you've kind of identified what the issue is, you've reassured them that we're on the same page, that we're working together to find the answer. The biggest thing there is you've got to own your part. And there's actually a book out there that I would rec recommend. It's called uh, Extreme Ownership. Uh, and I'd recommend everyone read it if you haven't had a chance to do it. It's a, it's a uh, really good book for just kind of leadership and making sure that you take ownership of the things that, that you have control of. But own your part. So if you did have a mistake in the project or you did have kind of an area where you could have done better, make sure you own up to that. Make sure and give that quick sentence. It doesn't have to be a long thing, but just kind of a quick, yep, you're right. We should have done a better job at gathering those requirements. Uh, we'll make sure and do a really good job of that the next time. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Make sure you own your part of that on what you could have done better. You also have to remain objective. So again, we all know that we're on the same side. We know we're working together to solve the problem. We know I had some part in to play in this problem. We want to remain objective and make sure that we're then trying to find the right outcome. Don't let your biases, don't let the things that you're feeling towards the customer really take over here. It's important that you remain objective as a part of these conversations. And then take a breath. It's okay to slow down. It's okay to kind of take a deep breath to make sure that you're showing compassion, that they can hear that in your voice, that you truly do want to work together to solve the problem. And then you validate their concerns. So I hear you. I know exactly what you're saying. That would be, that would be really frustrating for me if I was in your shoes, making sure that you're really validating what it is that they're feeling and what they're telling you. And then we get into really solving the problem. So once you've recognized that you're in the situation, reminding them that you're on the same page, work, that we're working together to solve the problem, I've owned up to my part, I've taken a deep breath, I've validated your concerns, the next thing I want to do is if the answer is no, no, I'm not going to give you a credit, then don't give me three sentences about how the answer is no. Don't give a slow no. So make sure you're quick to say, you know, we're not going to issue a credit here. Um, this is not something that we're going to do. The requirements were not vague. Now let's talk about what the real solution is. But what we can do is we can do X, Y, and Z. So if the answer is no, don't beat around the bush about it. Don't kind of give them a multiple sentence approach to it. Quickly tell them no, the answer is no, I'm not going to be able to do that. And then move on to another solution. And it's also okay not to have the answer as a part of this meeting. So if you don't have a creative way to solve the problem um, and the answer is no, we're not going to give you a credit or we're not going to change the scope of the project or we're not going to issue a change request, whatever the answer is, it's okay not to have the answer. And it's okay to then walk away from that conversation saying, let's take some more information. We're going to go look and do some research on our side. You can do some research on yours. And then let's schedule a meeting for uh, a, a couple of days from now. Let's get back on another quick call and talk about this again. Because sometimes that period of time will allow everyone to calm down, will allow everyone to kind of think about all the conversations you've had, to see it from a different perspective. And then sometimes you'll get on that next call and it will be really quick because everyone will have already thought about what the right solution is to solve the problem. So difficult conversations are by far the thing that defines a great consultant. A great consultant will always kind of handle these difficult conversations with grace. They'll handle them without getting emotionally involved and they will recognize when tone changes and be able to walk all the way through to a resolution. Um, and the outcome of that is not always a happy customer, but what it is, is it's always a customer that has the respect for that consultant. So we're almost finished. Number five, leverage technology. So we've really talked about building relationships, kind of gathering requirements, making sure that you are able to communicate those things out to your customer, that you're handling the difficult conversations. But out of all of this stuff, what part does technology play in this? And I think the key here is, first and foremost, taking notes. We use OneNote internally. I know a lot of you do as well. 
but it doesn't matter if you're writing it down on a piece of paper and then putting it into a note system later um, or writing it down and putting it in a binder. We've still got some customers that are doing that. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter as long as you're taking good notes. The most important skill that I believe that a consultant can ever develop is to be an amazing note taker. Uh, if you can just walk out of this, this session and say, I'm going to be a better note taker tomorrow than I am today, <clears throat> then that will really help your skills as a consultant. Making sure you're thorough, that you take good notes, that you document who it was that was saying those things. And if you haven't ever used it, OneNote has a record feature that will allow you to record the audio of the conversation and it will kind of keep track inside of your notes where that audio happened. And if you don't really remember what a note was talking about, you can go back and play and that will actually re re refresh the audio within that one line of when you were typing that note. So it's really cool uh, for going back and listening to the audio of a meeting after you've taken notes. So once you've got good notes, make sure you're sending all of your follow-up emails. Immediately convert any things that come out of those notes that are action items for you, action items for the customer. Immediately convert those to emails and make sure that those are going out to the customer quickly. Um, don't wait two days later. That needs to happen as soon as you possibly can to send those communications back out to the customer. That will show that you were engaged, that you understood the requirements, and it gives you the, the important step of being able to validate those requirements as you can. So sometimes, whether you're using requirements documents or user stories or whatever type of uh, method that you're using to then translate those requirements, that's the next step. So you've taken the notes, you've sent the follow-up emails, you then need to translate your notes into requirements. Make sure that you've appropriately communicated the requirements to the customer and that they say, yep, that looks good. That's exactly what we want. Once you do that, don't take this for granted. Make sure that you then take those requirements documents and break it out into tasks. Those tasks go into a system of some kind. And then you make sure inside of that system that you follow the hit by the bus plan. And that is making sure you document everything that was in your notes, make sure it's in some system that you're using. Now, if you're lucky enough that one note kind of is that system throughout the whole process, then that's great. If you're using something like ADO or Visual Studio Online or some other tool, Jira, um, to capture those requirements and tasks, or if you have a, a PM or kind of a um, business analyst that's that's taking those requirements and putting them into the system, all of that's fine. Make sure you're following the process though and that you're at least coming back to check to make sure that the requirements were translated into the system in the appropriate way. Walking away from a meeting that you've taken notes all the way to making sure that those then turn into beautiful user stories, that they really follow all of the appropriate path, that they're in a system and that they're well-documented, that closed loop process will be one of the biggest differences between being a good consultant and a great consultant. Great consultants take the time to make sure that all of that process is followed and they're not immediately on to the next meeting. You have to make sure and close the loop with your customers and leveraging technology to do it. So that's the end of the presentation today. Um, I hope that you've been able to kind of get something out of this very basic information that we were putting together. Uh, I wanted to share this with you because I know that a lot of, a lot of the, the, the people on this call and the, those that have been engaged with this conference have been very focused on building good things for their, for their companies and making sure that you're building amazing systems. But as a part of building an amazing system, I just want to see us not lose some of the very basic fundamentals that make you a great consultant for the company that you work for. Um, so with that, I will open it up. I don't know if we do we have the ability here um, to kind of see if there's any questions. I will also move on to another slide. Uh, while I do this, I'm going to look to see if we have any questions. If you have any questions, kind of put them in the comments. But also there is a QR code here. If you just grab your phone and hold it up and take a kind of a quick camera, this will take you to a, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a tickle in my throat. It will take you to a landing page 
where you can put in your information if you would like a copy of today's session materials. Um, and if you would also like my contact information, that will tell me that you want it and I'll send you a quick email as a follow-up here early next week to give you the copy of the PowerPoint presentation as well as my contact information. If you have any questions at all, this is the kind of seminars that we actually run for our customers. So if you want to see this happen inside of your organization where we kind of help do some coaching for you, we also do a lot of this around best practices for user adoption and some of the other things. Uh, I'd be happy to come and also help your company if that's something you would like, like for us to do. So scan this with your QR code. I'll give you a few moments here to do that while I'm looking at the comments. Hi, Dustin. Uh, this is the moderator here for your session. Uh, my name is Vicky Rogers. So I have three questions that I noted for you. Uh, okay, the great. first one is uh, Gulshan wants to know what are the big two items uh, that you talked about earlier in the presentation? He did not have the time to take that in note. Yes. So the big two were religion and politics. Um, try to stay away from religion and politics as a part of your conversations with your customers. Sometimes we get too casual and we feel comfortable enough to say those things, but um, religion and politics are always topics to avoid. Great. Uh, there is also a question from Luke who wants to know what are the best practices for communication uh, professionalism over mediums such as Microsoft Teams, chat, instant messaging, SMS, et cetera. Well, especially um, SMS and Microsoft Teams, as you start to communicate in those channels, things tend to get a bit more casual. Um, and, and that's okay. We certainly don't want to lose the personal feel. What I try to coach our consultants on is making sure you know who the audience is for that communication. So if it's an end customer, uh, make sure you're being more professional. If it's a member of your own company or your internal team, maybe you're a little more casual, um, still not crossing that line of professionalism. But I, would, I try to coach our consultants that it is okay to be a bit more casual with your internal team, but never with a customer. Making sure your customer is always, um, every communication you send, no matter the channel with a customer, needs to always follow the utmost professionalism. And then I also uh, noted a question from Yar. I'm sorry if I did not pronounce your name correctly. <laughs> um, so he or she wants to know how to tell uh, you don't know in a nice way. So uh, basically how yeah. to tell the consumer that you don't know something. Well, that's a great question. And I think um, as a consultant, that needs to be in your, in your repertoire, right? To be able to say, I don't know the answer to that question. Let me get back to you on that. Um, I, I find that if it's a technical question, I can lean very heavily on the technology part of it to defer it. So as an example, if someone asks me about how something works, I will give them the best answer that I know, but then I'll also say, you know, and let me do some more checking on that just to make sure that I'm giving you the right answer. Microsoft, there's a lot of changes that happen in this technology. Literally every single week, there's new things that get rolled out. I don't want to give you a wrong answer. Let me, let me circle back and I'll make sure and give that to you. And you can do that as long as you follow through on that communication. Don't tell them that you're going to follow up on it and then not. Uh, make sure that you truly are going to then circle back and send them another email or another communication that truly does um, answer their question in a more direct way. Okay. Now the floor is open to other questions. While you're doing that, I'm going to move over to um, for my slide. So same process, you can scan this QR code and fill out a survey for the session. I love your feedback. I, I welcome it. Anything at all that you could uh, see to improve the session or if you enjoyed it, we really appreciate these surveys. It helps us build a, a better conference.
Uh, there is Gushan again who wants to know how do you manage difficult stakeholders? Oh yeah. <laughs> so there's always difficult stakeholders. You're right. There's always those individuals inside of a company who are just kind of hard to get along with. And whether it's their personality or whether it's just that they have an agenda, what I always coach our consultants on is you have to find the thing that's most important to that stakeholder. So even if your project is about sales, as an example, let's say you're doing a sales implementation, that difficult stakeholder may be someone in customer service. And if that's the case, what you want to do is you want to find the one thing that customer service really cares about from sales and make sure that every communication that you have with that person centers around the thing that's most important to them. And a lot of times it has to do with how they're compensated, um, whether it's something that's customer satisfaction surveys or the um, customer churn, whatever metric that that person is looking for, make sure that you're focused on them. Um, and I think you'll find that a lot of those difficult customers will actually become your best advocates if you will just find the thing that's most important to them and target very specifically to it. That's a great question. I have a question. Um, one of the problems is that uh, Dynamics is it's a, quite a different way of developing things. You know, yeah. So much is already made. And sometimes clients want to have a very traditional DevOps uh, sort of slow cycle of development and and is there any insights on helping the cl a client understand um, sort of the, the faster development that we can do with that? Well, I see that a lot at the beginning of a project, right, where you're starting to convince them that a more agile approach or, or something similar to agile is the better way to do it. Um, and, and just a lot of times you have to prove it to them. Um, they're just not going to take your word for it and believe you until they're really in the guts of the project. And then at that point, they'll truly start seeing the value. So a lot of times what we will do is we will try to um, kind of sell the customer on a more agile methodology, but at the same time, still offering to deliver some of the documentation that they would need in a waterfall approach. So as an example, maybe you're still building user stories behind the scenes in DevOps or or JIRA or another tool, you're still kind of building out that more agile framework, but the things that you're actually delivering to the customer is a weekly status report with a, a project dashboard with a set of requirements documents and some technical, um, technical requirements documents. And what you'll have to do is you'll just have to manage those things as stories, right? Sometimes we'll have a story that is to go build a technical requirements document. And that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Because you shouldn't have to have some of those documentations as a part of, as a, part of a user story. But sometimes the customers just, they, they, they want to see them. Um, so you can kind of mix your approaches a little bit there until you get the customer to the point where they've truly bought in on that more agile approach. And then at that point, you can kind of start phasing out those more traditional waterfall type documents and things that they're looking for. Yeah, right. At the moment, I'm running into UX designers who are trying to reinvent the wheel on the CRM solution and, and don't understand <laughs> yeah. and, and all that stuff. And, and I'm just like, and they're, you know, they're promising things to the client that, that we can deliver, but really aren't, you know, good grief. We don't, we don't need two, you know, months and months of, of UX design. We can get this thing done, right. and prototyped, and if they don't like it, we change it and let's go, you know. And that's that's very common. A lot of times you'll see that with customers that have a lot of a lot of past projects that were more custom build where they could do anything they wanted to do. Right. So they spend so much time doing UX design that they forget about um, the real important part of a dynamics project, which is more about business process and workflow and analytics and some of those things uh, that right. they're so focused on UI. But it, it's it, it's sometimes also really helpful to get them engaged in the customization process. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll find someone inside of the customer's organization that could actually do some of those changing of forms, creating some views, building a dashboard, and we'll train them on how to do it and let them share some of the project load. And then they will then be our champion internally for why should we spend so much time building some custom UX thing when I can have that form built for you if you'll just use it out of the box in five minutes. 
Um, so I think if you can find that person internally that you could train, that could help too. Don't, don't have to make a wireframe for everything. Come on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Even if you do it, I can't do it, you know, or unless, you know, power apps is allowing me to do it, but, but on dynamics, I can't. So, you know, move. <laughs> right. Exactly. And sometimes we've turned wireframes instead of doing a wireframe, we'll actually do a form design, right? Um, sure. So instead of using a real wireframe document, it will be a real form that we've built and exactly. and printed out a copy of it just to try to get away from some of that. Yeah. Yeah. It'll it'll take time. I think your customers will get there, and the more and more we more and more we start pushing these kind of projects running in that way, I think the more adoption we'll see. Yep. Good question. Thanks for the great presentation. Well, thank you. Another question that was asked is, and sort of a follow-up is, what advice would you give a new and not so confident consultant who is going out on their first project? And then sort of another tangent is, what advice would you give uh, to someone who is transitioning from being a Microsoft Dynamics 365 administrator working at an end user who is now transitioning towards becoming a Microsoft Dynamics 365 consultant as a partner? Sure. So we'll take the, the first question about the junior consultant kind of a, as your first going out into your first meeting. Well, I would just say hopefully you're not doing that alone and that you have someone that's more senior that can kind of go along with you. But sometimes that's not always the case, especially in small organizations. You may just be thrown in and, and asked to kind of go do the requirements gathering or architecture level conversations all by yourself. Um, and in those instances, what I would recommend is make sure you take a lot of time up front to actually write out the questions that you want to ask. You don't want to be in the meeting and not have anything to say um, or to forget about some very key areas. So what we will do a lot of times is I'll have our more junior consultants, they'll schedule uh, some sort of a meeting before the meeting that will help identify the key areas that you want to cover as a part of a requirements gathering meeting or a design session. Once you have those bullets, you can then put them into OneNote and then actually write out your questions um, as a part of that. That will help help you feel like that you don't then have to scramble for stuff to talk about or questions to ask in the meeting, that you'll be prepared for the questions. You can then focus in the meeting more on the answers to those questions more than trying to come up with what the next thing um, is for you to say. So I try to do that a lot, even, even still. I've been doing this for a long time, but I still sometimes will write out my questions just so that way um, I know for, for sure what I want to ask those customers. And then the second part of that was um, more around kind of transitioning from more of an end user, um, an administrator, or some sort of a systems admin for Dynamics within an end user, and moving more towards the partner community. And that, that is actually, I find, an easier transition than the other way. Um, a lot of times transitioning from a partner organization to a customer I mean, sometimes it works. It just depends on the person. Um, I, I find the, cons the good consultants have a very distinct personality. Um, and a lot of times those personalities are not happy a lot of times with just um, being stuck with one customer and their project alone. They like the variety of working for five different industries and five different customers on three or four different projects at one time. So I think you're actually going to find that that transition is easier than going the other way. Uh, it all depends on the individual, though. So what, what should you do making the transition from the end user to the consulting world? And I would say that you really have to make sure that you broaden your technology horizon. You need to make sure that you're spending personal time, um, even away from your, your, your day job, so to speak, that you're really spending that time to understand at a high level project service and field service and Power BI and Power Apps and Canvas apps and what's possible with Azure and what can you do with um, DevOps and some of the other things that are out there. You don't have to be an expert at all of it, but a lot of times with an end user, you're very siloed in the technology that you get exposed to because it's just within your one area. But as a consultant for a partner specifically, you're gonna have to at least understand at a high level all of those different things. Uh, and the great consultants actually understand all of those things at even the next level down. Uh, but at least having a basic understanding of what they do and where they fit in the full Microsoft stack is going to be one of the most important things you can do 
to transition from end user to uh, to a partner based consulting organization. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Thanks everybody so much for taking your time. I know we're running a little bit a little bit over schedule here, so I'll let you guys get to your next session if you haven't already. Thanks all. Have a great day.